When it comes to life on Earth, one of the most common things we're taught is the fact that life changes over time in a process called evolution. More than that, populations can change so much that they can become different species, which is how we have so much incredible diversity here on Earth. On Nature League, we explored the theme of evolution and speciation. It began with a lesson plan about the process of evolution and the different ways that new species arise. Evolution is one of the central concepts in biology, and it's no wonder why. Everything alive today is a product of many changes over time. While evolution is a relatively straightforward topic, and most people know about the basics, there are some fun facts and nuances to be explored. Charles Darwin is considered to be the founding father of the theory of evolution, namely because of publishing the seminal work on the topic. However, in the first edition of his book, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, Darwin never once actually used the word evolution. For Darwin, it made more sense to speak of this change over time as descent with modification. That is, the existence of new and different species over time that showed numerous changes. But where did this idea come from? And what led to these observations? It turns out that the theory of evolution came to us from some of my favorite places on Earth. Islands. Darwin and other naturalists in the mid-19th century, like Alfred Russell Wallace, made observations on islands that led to several different inferences. These inferences were then combined into the single working theory of natural selection. Here's a breakdown of these observations. Observation 1. All species have great potential fertility. Uh, yep. Life on Earth is pretty good at making more of itself. Rabbits? Case in point. Observation 2. Populations are generally stable. Fair enough. In general, populations don't boom overnight or go extinct in a few weeks. There are regulating forces at play that create a general sense of stability, at least over short time periods. Observation 3. Resources are limited. Indeed, there's only so much available food, water, shelter, and habitat for all living members of a certain species. These observations led to inference 1. There is a struggle for existence. And inference 2. This struggle isn't random and must depend on some heritable trait being passed on from the parents. And that process of unequal survival ability is the process of natural selection. So that's natural selection. However, natural selection isn't the same thing as evolution. Natural selection is one mechanism of evolution. Evolution depends on four main mechanisms. Mutation, gene flow, genetic drift, and yep, natural selection. Let's briefly check out these mechanisms. Genetic mutation is the point source for almost all variations of life on Earth. Mutations are errors in processes like DNA replication that cause a change to the DNA itself. This means that the mutation can be passed on to the next generation. Gene flow is exactly what it sounds like. It's the flow of genes between populations. This happens when individuals move into and reproduce with a new population. Genetic drift is an odd concept, but it can be defined as the mechanism of change in population gene frequencies due to random sampling of genes. Let's look at an example. Let's say there's a population of sharks, and at a certain gene location, 75% of genes in that population are a blue version, and 25% are red. When individuals in this population begin to mate, there are all kinds of things that can happen. By chance, it's possible that one individual doesn't mate at all, or that a shark with two blue copies mates with a shark with two red copies. This means that in the next generation, the frequencies of those blue and red genes won't be 75% and 25% anymore. They could be something like 71% and 29%. And that change in gene frequencies over time due to random sampling is what we call genetic drift. The fourth and final mechanism of evolution is natural selection, which we've already talked about. Natural selection is the process of change over time due to unequal reproductive success. That unequal success has to do with differences in traits and whether or not those traits are well suited to the current environment. So how are these processes related to speciation or the appearance of new species over time? It turns out Darwin had an additional inference in mind, and this third inference states that this process of gradual change by natural selection could lead to new species. When we talk about speciation, there needs to be some real talk up front. The definition for a species can be blurry at best. In fact, there are several different working definitions for what a species is even within the same fields of science. That being said, the various definitions for what a species is can all agree that different species arise over time. This formation of new species due to continual evolution is called speciation, and there are two main types. The first type is allopatric speciation. This happens when two populations of a species are geographically isolated. Over enough time, genetic changes can occur for both populations, and if enough changes happen and the two populations never mate with each other, a new species can evolve. What about a situation where the populations don't get separated in space? This is called sympatric speciation, and it's when two populations become reproductively isolated even though they share the same space. This isolation can happen because of things like food preference, filling a certain ecological niche, or any number of other behaviors. So we've got natural selection, which can lead to speciation, and we've figured it all out. Evolution. 
Check. Or maybe not. Are there ways that organisms, populations, and species can change over time that aren't part of Darwin's theory of evolution? For the last part of this lesson plan, we're going to touch on the concept of epigenetics, a newer topic that potentially explains a separate, not quite Darwinian, mechanism of evolution. Epigenetics can be broadly defined as heritable changes to an organism's genome that affect things like gene expression or packaging, but don't change the actual DNA sequence itself. These changes can be caused by the environment. Basically, gene expression can be altered chemically because of something like diet, or exposure to a chemical, or trauma. The idea of the environment directly changing an organism's traits and those traits being passed on wasn't quite on Darwin's radar when he was thinking through heritable changes. However, it was on someone else's mind. Sort of. Before Darwin came on the scene, there were several scientists and naturalists who noticed life on Earth changing gradually over time. One of the most famous, or infamous, was Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck, who published a hypothetical mechanism for how evolution occurs in 1809, the very same year that Darwin was born. In his mechanism, he mentioned two principles. First, that used traits become more pronounced, while unused traits deteriorate and second, that these acquired traits could be inherited. That second part is what made myself and others in my ninth grade biology class laugh out loud when our teacher mentioned Lamarck's ideas. We were all like, yeah, cool, Lamarck, because if you chop off someone's arm, they're totally gonna have babies with only one arm. Good one. And yet, here we are now discovering that acquired characteristics, especially chemical changes caused by the environment, can in fact be inherited. Not in terms of the DNA sequence itself, but in terms of gene expression, i.e., epigenetics. Lamarck's revenge? Not quite. It's true that traits acquired during an organism's lifetime can be passed on, but we're still trying to figure out the basics, like how many generations those changes can persist across. At the very least, we should consider his work as an example of why keeping an open mind is beneficial in science, especially when it comes to life on Earth. To learn more about speciation, we headed out for a field trip to the Flathead River system and investigated what's happening between cutthroat and rainbow trout here in Montana. The West Slope cutthroat trout is a subspecies of cutthroat trout, which holds the distinction of being Montana's state fish. One of the biggest threats to West Slope cutthroat trout in Montana is hybridization with other fish species, and the loss of genes unique to this species. We checked in with Jeff Strait, a PhD student at the University of Montana, to learn more about the research being done to monitor the West Slope cutthroat trout. Hybridization, tell me, what is that process? So hybridization is just the interbreeding between individuals of two distinct populations or species. It doesn't imply anything about the success or failure of that encounter between those individuals. It just implies that it occurs. There's a broad range of consequences that can occur as a result of, of hybridization. So what are some negative consequences, particularly in what we're seeing right out here in Montana with these fish? Especially the state of Montana and, and a lot of groups value native species, value unique species, and so hybridization is a homogenizing force, you know, combi you're essentially combining two different species and reducing biodiversity in that sense. Ecologically, some of the consequences um, of hybridization in, in, in this particular case study of West Slope Cutthroat and Rainbow are that we've seen lower fitness in hybrid individuals, and that's really concerning to, the, to fish managers and fish biologists in the state, as well as anglers, because if there's lower reproductive success, lower fitness in hybrids, you might see populations crashing. So the West Slope cutthroat trout, that's a subspecies of cutthroat, mm -hmm. and that's a, one of the state fish of Montana, right? So people yep. love this individual. But rainbow trout, what's their story? Kind of how did they get here? So rainbow trout were not native to most of Montana. They're, there's one river system that runs through the northwest corner where they are native, and they overlap with cutthroat trout there. but. You know, due to just human activity, we love to fish, and we love to fish for multiple species. So rainbow trout have been stocked on almost every continent across across the planet. Right. Stocked across the state of Montana, as well as a number of other species of, of trout and, and fishes as well. The issue here, though, is that obviously, like we've been talking about, they can interbreed with our with a native species. Now they're on the same, they're landscaped together, they overlap spatially where they never would have overlapped, and we're seeing, as a result of that, introgression between these two different species. Introgression is a process, right, when we're typically talking about genes or genomic material. Mm -hmm. So how would you kind of define introgression? Introgression is just the incorporation of genes from one population or species into another. Sure, and we're seeing this with some of the, the cutthroat trout, particularly in the area that we were able to sample. So we were able to go out uh, with the field crew and saw all kinds of things happening, um, but I wanted to follow up and see a little bit about what is that data and kind of what is it telling us? We've been doing this field work out there, capturing individuals in these streams and 
um, pit tagging them with, with a little unique code that allows us to identify them individually as we recapture them in the future. And so from those recapture data, we're gonna get things like growth rate, survival estimates, movement data. So it, does the individual remain as a resident in these streams or are they moving out to the bigger river system where they will ultimately grow larger and come back as a larger migratory individual. So we're using all of these to see how hybridization and introgression with rainbow trout might affect multiple fitness traits because there's a lot of evidence out there showing that in some cases, hybridization between two species can cause a negative response in, in some fitness trait, but not, it's not consistent across all these traits. What are you guys seeing so far? Are you seeing positive effects, negative effects? What's it looking like on the ground? There was an original paper, really the, the heavy hitter in this case showed that there was severe outbreeding depression, so in, in the form of reproductive success. So hybrids had much lower reproductive success, fewer offspring than, than a pure cutthroat in this one system. However, we've seen hybridization can, or introgression continues to spread across the landscape, which would suggest that they must be successful to some degree. Sure. And then there's another paper that looked at landscape patterns as well, but also detected signatures of selection against rainbow trout alleles. There's been evidence that there's selection against rainbow trout introgression, but we're still seeing this pattern of spread. And so that's where we're really excited to get the data set I've been working on analyzed and out there is because we're gonna be able to look at fitness, multiple fitness traits across multiple populations, many years of data, thousands of individuals, and it's really gonna hopefully shed some light on how variable are the consequences, what traits are positively influenced, what traits are negatively influenced, and then the ultimate goal would be to wrap that all together and to be, what does this mean for, for West Slope Cutthroat Trout in Western Montana, and do we need to be worried, is introgression gonna sort itself out or do we need to take a more direct management action to prevent this mm -hmm. continued spread of, of rainbow trout hybridization. And now a word, not from our sponsors, but from the dictionary. Welcome to this month's Wild Word. Once a month on Nature League, we'll look at the etymology or origin and history of words related to nature. This month's theme is evolution and speciation. And during our lesson plan, we discussed the two main types of speciation, allopatric and sympatric. We defined and discussed these terms, but we didn't break them down in terms of etymology. Let's do that now. Allopatric and sympatric are not words that are used in common conversation. However, the pieces of these words are derived from some classics that get used in our language all the time. Let's first look at the common piece of these words. That's the Patrick part at the end, allopatric and sympatric. But what does that piece mean? Patrick comes from the Latin patria, which means homeland or native land. This comes from the Latin pater, which means father. This is shared with Greek as patra in that language means fatherland. We commonly use the word patriotic in English to refer to feelings about the homeland, and Patrick is that same concept. All right, so now we're left with allo homeland and sim homeland. Let's check out these prefixes. Allo comes to us from the Greek allos, which means other or different. So allopatric means different homeland. The prefix sim also comes from Greek. This root word is sin, and it means alike or together. So sympatric means together homeland. I love these words because they perfectly explain the concepts of their respective speciation events. Allopatric speciation is defined as a speciation event occurring when populations are separated in space and become reproductively isolated, whereas sympatric Patrick speciation is reproductive isolation occurring within the same geographical area. But we don't even need these definitions because the words themselves tell the story. Allopatric speciation literally means different homeland speciation, and sympatric speciation literally means together homeland speciation. That's exactly what these evolutionary events are, and that is pretty wild. In the state of Montana, their state agency has it in their mission statement to conserve native fishes and native species generally. And so there is a big push from within the agency to understand what's going on here and try to conserve pure West Slope populations where they still exist, which according to the last estimate might be only 10% of their historic distribution. So it's really taken a high priority in, in the regions I've been working in and the managers are really excited to get the results and start conserving West Slope. The constructed lines of what we call a species and the consequences of when those lines get crossed are one of the biggest topics in wildlife conservation. The effects and values associated with hybridization and introgression are complicated and deserve consideration from multiple angles. As for the West Slope cutthroat trout, only time and more data will inform us of the fate of one of Montana's favorite species. Like in any other field of science, common assumptions and theories in biology come and go when new research shines light on unexpected processes. We next explored the theme of evolution and speciation in a format called Denatured, where I broke down a popular peer-reviewed journal article on where new marine fish species are appearing most rapidly around the world.
For this month's Denatured segment, we're going to look at an article released in July of 2018 in the journal Nature. In this month's lesson plan, we talked about the mechanisms of evolution. We also discussed the concept of speciation and the different ways that new species arise on Earth. One of the most general patterns of speciation we see on our planet has to do with where we see it happening the fastest. In this paper entitled An Inverse Latitudinal Gradient and Speciation Rate for Marine Fishes, the researchers investigated the relationship between species richness, speciation rates, and latitude in marine fishes. So here's what's already known. Evidence from hundreds of years of biological research suggests that species richness, or the total number of different species in a region, is highest at the equator and lowest at the Earth's poles. I mean, when you think of dazzling displays of biodiversity, Antarctica doesn't quite come to mind as fast as the Amazon rainforest. This pattern is called the Latitudinal Diversity Gradient, or LDG, and many studies suggest that this gradient exists because rates of speciation are highest at the tropics. This study focused on marine fishes, a group of organisms that also exhibits this pattern of high species richness at low latitudes. Just think of the incredible array of marine diversity in tropical shallow waters. There's a reason these are some of the most beloved places on Earth for divers, snorkelers, and ocean enthusiasts, myself included. So is this diversity gradient a result of higher speciation rates or something else? To address the relationships between latitude, species richness, and speciation rates, the researchers first assembled something called a time calibrated phylogeny for more than 31,000 ray finned fishes. In general, a phylogeny is a history of the lineages of a group of organisms. Phylogenies can be visually represented as phylogenetic trees. Phylogenetic trees show relative times of when species diverge. In this study, the authors use a combination of genetic data and fossil species to create and calibrate their marine fish phylogenetic tree. This calibration step changes the relative times of divergence to actual times. So instead of saying species B diverged from species A before species C did it, the tree can be read as species B diverged from species A two million years ago, whereas species C diverged one million years ago. Sweet, so we have a tree, and a really detailed one at that. In fact, the tree constructed by this team is the largest fish tree to date. Once they created this massive phylogeny of ray finned fishes, the researchers used three mechanisms to estimate the speciation rates of these fishes, a framework called BAM, a summary statistic called DR, and the interval rates method. The team computed speciation rates using each of the three methods for 106 families of marine fishes. The final piece was figuring out where these species live. The team gathered geographic ranges for the majority of known marine species by using an AquaMap algorithm and information from over 100 other organizations. The algorithm provided by AquaMaps estimates geographic ranges for marine fishes using a combination of factors like species occurrences, expert knowledge, and environmental preferences of the fish species themselves. With all this info combined, the team was able to estimate where speciation rates are fastest for marine fishes. So what did they find? The first result the team notes is a strong latitudinal diversity gradient in marine fish species. This result is consistent with previous studies, and the highest species richness was found in the coral triangle of the tropical Indo-Pacific Ocean. This goes along with the traditional biological wisdom. So far, so unsurprising. But here's the crazy part. They found the exact opposite pattern in the speciation rate results. All three estimates of speciation rates were highest at the poles of the Earth and lowest near the equator. In fact, cold temperate and polar lineages of marine fish had speciation rates almost twice as fast as the average low latitude lineage. In the last piece of their article, the authors offer that there are still some unknowns regarding their results. These unknowns represent future exciting directions for their research, namely investigating whether the rapid rates they found in cold ocean regions reflects a relatively new expansion of marine biology. Biodiversity. This article was published in the journal Nature, which is no easy feat. This journal typically only publishes studies with groundbreaking results that are widely applicable and really transform the face of science. Here are some reasons why I think this study wound up in this journal. Here's the thing. Scientists working in evolutionary biology, biodiversity, and related fields have time and time again found higher species richness at low latitudes. And they've generally thought that this was a result of higher speciation rates in those regions. The results of this study provide evidence directly against that claim. Not only that, but the results sort of fly in the face of several established relationships between thermal energy and speciation. I mean, just look at the biodiversity of fishes in the tropics. It's totally wild to think that speciation rates are significantly lower there 
than in the Arctic. But here's where the study is really potentially transformative. If these results hold up for other groups of organisms, like species that live on the land, for instance, this could mean that the latitudinal diversity gradient we see for life on Earth could be due to something completely different than speciation rates. This opens the door for a ton of exciting new research, which is certainly one of the reasons this article made it into such a top-tier publication. As with any piece of exciting new research that goes against the grain of well-known patterns, there's a potential for getting caught up in the excitement and overlooking confounding variables. The authors do a great job of pointing out these potential confounding variables and explaining how they address them. One of these potential trouble areas has to do with whether a separate variable is associated with high rates of speciation. That could mean that the results they saw have nothing to do with latitude. The authors provide one possible variable like this. They mentioned that, instead of latitude, the high speciation rates could have to do with environmental factors in these cold and dark regions. However, the team tested this by comparing deep-sea fishes at low latitudes to deep-sea fishes at high latitudes. They found that high-latitude deep-sea fishes have much faster speciation rates than low-latitude fish. So hey, looks like latitude is still the biggest factor. Confounding variables aside, my biggest issue with this study isn't about the study itself. It's about the way it's being portrayed. Science is the process of ruling things out. And in fields like evolutionary biology, our understanding of other species on Earth is constantly, well, evolving. Unfortunately, these results have been portrayed in some write-ups as completely upending 200 years of biodiversity understanding. I've even seen phrases like, biologists have been wrong the whole time, and everything we thought we knew is a lie. You know. Nothing like hyperbole in science. Here's the thing. It's not that their results mean that scientists have been wrong the whole time about speciation and latitude. They've simply contributed one more piece of the puzzle. And yes, that piece might look a little bit different than the others, but that's science, and good science at that. Scientists and the public alike must always keep an open mind when it comes to how much we simply don't know about the world around us. And as long as we keep asking questions about these amazing puzzles, we might just keep finding some incredible pieces. To round out the topic of evolution and speciation, my good friend Adrian Adams joined me in a very special installment of From A to B, where we attempted to create some hypothetical humans of the future. This month has been all about evolution and speciation, so things changing over time, and Adrian and I have decided to go back and forth and kind of make up our own version of humans in the future as if after many, many years of evolution, we might have certain traits and features not there anymore and certain ones maybe appear. And we're literally just going to go back and forth and see what happens and enjoy ourselves along the way thinking about how some of these might be adaptive or uh, terrible. I'm going to be in red and Brit's going to be in blue. Just going to start with the eyes. It's going to be great for daytime, not depth because in the future, we're going to have screens in front of our faces all the time. Okay. So a creature that can stare at something really, really close a lot without hurting its eyes. Do you want to be able to let in more light if we're imagining being with screens? In which case, you'd want to have the retina, so the iris and the space inside, be able to be way wider. If it's a matter Nailed it. Stop talking. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the humans of the future are just going to be like... No, 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 no. Lemons for eyes! So typically you see larger eyes and things that are nocturnal, again, because they're wanting to let in more light. So I guess we're saying that screens... Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll basically consider screens to be a type of nocturnal adaptation. Yes! Okay, let's go to the nose. In the future, there is going to be giant like uh, Wally sized piles of garbage just everywhere because we're not taking care of the planet very well. I think that it might actually behoove us to have less good noses. So you just think that the stench of Earth will be so much We'll that... just be so awful that we're gonna wish we smelled less. Well, I'd say in terms of the evolution of a nose, yeah, we, I mean, we just don't rely on them yeah, that much. And don't. then also garbage. So would we say like no nose? Or are we talking like Voldemort? What's Yeah, <laughs> little Voldemort. What are we gonna do with our mouths in the future? Wisdom teeth have to go because we just haven't had enough time and there has not been enough pressure for us to lose these things. Sometimes they can be harmful, sometimes... Why are you still doing that right now? My wisdom teeth fit perfectly in my mouth. I'm sorry, I'm just saying that I'm more evolved than you are. <laughs> that is not what that means at all. So, 
I don't really know how to graphically represent that. Just draw a mouth with only 32 teeth. I'm not going to draw that many teeth on here. It will look terrifying. <laughs> Let's just kind of do a, a cartoon version and then there's X's maybe. <laughs> Does that? <laughs> Terrible. I don't think that Terrible can... and I hate it. We haven't hit ear. Do you have? Is there yes. Any... We're going straight to robot ears. What? <laughs> what? What does that even mean? <laughs> No, stop. <laughs> stop. Stop, stop. Stop it. Okay, robot ears, because with the uh, techno music and the young kids these days, no. and, you know, do you like robot music? No, you would if you had robot ears. With evolution, there has to be, there, it, we see reasons for adaptations persisting over time. So for something that extreme to happen, what do you see causing that evolutionary change? You're right, we're abandoning robot <laughs> ears. You don't have to. No, no, no. We're abandoning, okay, you know what? Everybody will have one, one robot ear <laughs> and just, uh, you know, just- Keep that one Just a perfectly as normal is. human ear. Okay. Okay, so sh either shoulders okay. or uh, pecs. Boobs are really inconvenient. They just are. And the thing is, you're only using them for a very small uh, amount of time in your life, if at all. Mm -hmm. And it's a whole lot of flesh to take care of, back problems. Right. I, you know, playing pool got very complicated, and I used to really like that game, and that's just unfortunate. I, they gotta go. Okay. They gotta go. So, I mean, we are mammals, and so there's, we still need to be able to... F <gasps> <gasps> Dolphin nipples! Dolphin nipple slits! I may or may not have mentioned to Adrian along the course of friendship that dolphins have nipple slits that the, the, the nipple is actually inside, because again, swimming, that's the aerodynamic form. They have them actually like inverted and then they just have slits. So actually I'm I'm pretty much fine with that. There's it's just kind of a longer slit. Those are <laughs> all you all you've drawn are slits. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is slits. Do you have anything for neck shoulder kind of stuff? Uh yes, tech neck is a thing. Everybody like this. I myself am a big sufferer, you know. My posture is awful. I'm so what too. we're going to do is we're going to create Something that I'm going to call the T-bone <laughs> TM. No, what? And it's gonna be it's gonna be in our spine. It's gonna be a bone, and it's gonna start here, and then it's gonna branch out like this <laughs> and protrude slightly <laughs> on either side, and it will. Uh, those are little bones. <laughs> little bones. Uh, and it's going to keep us, uh, it's going to keep our posture nice and straight and it's going to be perfect and it'll incorporate to the rest of our spine. See, that's the spine bones and... You have literally just drawn the cervical vertebra and clavicles. What is different about this? No, it's one solid piece in the center that just goes and it protrudes out the whole thing. So you can't even pull on it. You also can't go like this. Look at what I'm doing right now. You, you wouldn't be able to do these. this anymore. That's, a, that's you a problem. You wouldn't be able to do this. That's a problem. No, it's not. Can you take off your shirt without doing that? You know what? It's going to have a spring connected behind and that, sp that coil will constantly be pulling you back. So you can pull it forward, but then it'll snap right back and your posture will be perfect. I'm going to leave it alone. I think it's an aesthetic choice. Well, evolution typically Keep... is not an aesthetic situation. Say that to all the pretty birds in the world. Go next. So let's hit things that things that are definitely under selection are things having to do with reproduction because that is a big time part of being life on Earth. Okay. So a lot of different pieces of us have to do with uh, reproducing, surviving, thriving, all that good stuff. A lot goes into humans and, and childbirth. We have babies so early on, like when they're, they're basically hardly even developed at all because of the birth canal and hips and the actual sh infrastructure of women and how big heads are because of how big our brains are. And so we actually have a lot, our children premature because that's the only way it works. You're suggesting we have a it's marsupial pouch. No, no, no. Yes. No, that's literally the same thing. Marsupial pouch. You just drew a uterus on the outside. It doesn't get rid of the issue. No, so what it does well, is okay. now, so it's no gonna, birth. so the baby's gonna climb out on its own. <laughs> And it's gonna use its freakishly strong little fetus arms. You get to draw the little baby fetus climbing up into the into the pouch. It's gonna use its freakishly strong little fetus arms to climb up and attach itself to <laughs> keeping the adaptations on. You're right. The nipples should be in the pouch, but so there's more nipples in the pouch. <laughs> yes. 
Thank you. That's how we reproduce now. Great. And it's just gonna hang out there till it's like uh, two. It's just gonna come on out and yeah. it's just gonna start walking well, that also, and learning how to talk. You may say what you wish about external genitalia. I've completely locked Scrapped boobs it. off, so. Straw cloaca. We're just gonna streamline the whole thing <laughs> and we're just gonna have cloacas from now on. One hole does it all. I'm just gonna write the word cloaca. <laughs> <laughs> Our knees are so bad yes. because of this whole like walking on two feet thing, which is bipedal and everybody's always wrecking their knees. So like the steel reinforced the, I don't even know. I'm just gonna draw slits again because that seems no, to be No, that's boring. Okay, well, uh, draw a pad. It, you're, you're, oh, and like a knee pad? Yeah. That's yeah. already, that's our, that's the patella is the knee pad. So I just need to make it clear that these are steel reinforced. So this kind of structuring is happening somewhere inside the knee. We just need a little bit more. I feel like our hands could be a little bit better as well. I feel like we just don't have enough fingers as is. No, that it's not, what, don't what have are plenty, you not? We don't have enough fingers. And also arthritis in our hands, what a sad thing. So what do we do? We get rid of our phalanges. Very good. And we put in Mm -mm. Just little, like, mm. uh, finger worms. This is what our, our... How does that help anything? It, cause, cause now there's no bones to hurt. Ow, ooh, ouch, my bones. But you can't... So if you drink bone hurting juice, you, uh, you, there's no longer a thing. So, uh, we control them and, uh, I... You know, I think, and also there's one over there. Having hand dexterity, though, being able to do really, really baby little motions are yeah, one of the... you can do that. Boop, 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 boop. Not without bones. You do feet. Do something big and dramatic. Why? I swear if you just draw feet slits. <laughs> <laughs> it's not feet that I find to be a problem. It's lower back issues, which... Okay, so fix the lower back. Okay, well, that comes more from needing support. So, so again, being bipedal, we kind of quite, we're not quite there yet uh, in terms of it being a perfect design. So a lot of people have lower back issues because again, having, being on two legs and figuring it out, right? So that, uh, I don't know, we could add something. Pillows to our feet. Our feet will just be super fatty and they'll just have all this fatty tissue. But that and we'll just bleep, bleep, But having bleep. support like feet or inserts, like inserts into shoes, that doesn't actually help the fact that the actual lower back itself. So draw You another... can add a third leg. Yeah. Third leg! Oh, I love it! Tripod it. Except, you know what? Nature doesn't work that way, Brit. Add a fourth leg so that we're... Uh, it's not radial symmetry. It's, it's bilateral <laughs> symmetry. Yeah! Yeah, you add that fourth leg. I'm so proud. Get that fourth leg. <laughs> Get that fourth leg. You know what? And just for one last little thing. Wait, you were the one that put a one-sided... One, <laughs> one single hair. Okay. We don't need hair anymore. I it's the thing don't... of the future. How are you gonna text? <laughs> Man, keyboards are gonna be crazy in like Ugh. ten thousand years. The point is, all the really crazy adaptations we see on Earth happen because life is constantly evolving, it's changing, it's fitting its environment in all kinds of ways that are amazing. Who knows what humans will look like after a long time. The topic of evolution and speciation is a huge one in biology, and we had a great time exploring and creating the content you've seen in this compilation. Thanks so much for watching, and if you'd like to keep going on Life on Earth adventures with us here on Nature League, make sure to go to youtube.com slash Nature League, subscribe, and share. Hey guys, we now have a Nature League pin on dftba.com. Click on the link in the description below to get yours.